And this is something we saw on virtually every MS patient, to my uh, astonishment. So that's patient number one. And you can see the pronounced interruption of CSF flow here on patient, MS patient number two. Hey everyone, Dr. Salisbury here. I'm here with Patricia, and she's gone through a journey in her life trying to find out how to get rid of all these symptoms and all these diagnoses. And she came across our clinic. Can you tell us uh, what symptoms you came in with? Um, back pain, headaches, um, dizziness. Dizziness? I didn't even put dizziness yeah, on there, Dan. I a little bit of dizziness, but it's gone away. So. Okay, heck yeah. Sorry. No, so Pretend tell us about there. these diagnoses. So, um, Tell us about your multiple sclerosis. How did you get that diagnosed? Um, I went to the, my general general doctor, uh -huh. and my face was numb, and okay. so the doctor just told me I had to go get an MRI to see if I have Bell's palsy. Right. Come to find out, I have MS. Really? So, yeah. And did they look at MRIs and stuff? They looked at MRIs, and they had a spinal tap. And what clinic was that at? Doctor, Dr. Banks. Okay, cool. Yeah. And that's here in Utah. And so they diagnosed yeah. you with multiple sclerosis. Yes. And what did they, what were the treatment for multiple sclerosis to go after? Um, they put me on medication, um, injections, uh, Copax, Copaxone. Yeah. And did yeah. they continue that or did, how I did, did it for quite a while. Did it help you? Yes. So she felt did. some relief from doing that. That's yes. really great. The medication's designed to help with that. And did it have any side effects? When I injected it, it made my joints stiff and hurt. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear. Yeah. All right, tell me about the epilepsy. How did you have epilepsy? How often would you get it? And how were you diagnosed with that? Um, so I had an incident at my normal doctor. Um, yeah. So I found out that I was having seizures. So I went to my doctor bank. So I did all that fun sleep. Oh. Um, and you just kind of collapse anywhere, would you? And yeah. hit your head or that's dangerous. Okay. Yeah. And so did you give you any medication or anything to treat that? Yes. Um, did you notice any difference after starting care with us? How do you know what we did helped you with that? Um, less stress. Okay. You're um, going through less stress and your brain can handle all that? Yep. Okay. Yep. I don't have much panic attacks. I just... So your panic attacks have changed since coming in? Yeah. Okay, and cool. I, it's been a really long time. Since you had one? Yeah. All your symptoms of multiple sclerosis, what happened to that numbness in your face? Did that stop after seeing us? Yep. Yeah, I don't have any numbness. I'm, That's cool, huh? I don't even feel like I have MS right so, now. So. That's amazing. And yeah. that happened right after starting to see us. And tell us about your stomach pain. And where did, why did you start to get stomach pain? I got stomach pain. I didn't know why I was having it. So I went to, what are they called? Ga neuro A gastroenterologist. Gast Thank yeah. you. And I found out that I have ulcers because I got addicted to... Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen, was that for headaches or what? Yeah, I was taking it for headaches. And, and that then, caused a problem with your stomach, and then yeah. you started having stomach pain and all yeah. these other problems that messed yeah. up your digestion so you couldn't assimilate things, and that caused Correct. more problems and more depression type, you know, symptoms. Correct. Okay. And then tell us about the sharp pressure headaches that you had. And where was the pressure? And you said you had burning. Can you describe that for us? Oh, geez. Okay, so when I have pressure headaches in the back of my, my neck, and okay. it runs up into right here, um, in my temples. On the right side? It's mainly on the right side, And that's yes. where you have all that crazy tension. Her Correct. bone, the top bone in her neck is completely rotated. And just on the x-ray, mm -hmm. everything we're looking at is completely rotated. Uh, so that congestion has caused all these problems. Okay. And then um, tell us about your jaw pain and stuff. Jaw pain. That is a lot better because it's mainly on my right side and it's so much looser. Oh, awesome. And that happened really fast. I remember that, that was happened like, fast. That released fast. Yes. And... Um, after seeing all these different medical doctors and all these things, we're all, everyone's on your team to try to help you. Right. Um, what do, you, do you have any recommendations for anybody at home that's skeptical or wanting to know if they should come after something like this? Yes, I'm getting my family to do it too, so, well, yeah. Yeah, no, that's it, cool. to is what is the possibility that some of these uh, craniocervical syndromes will turn into one of these neuro neurodegenerative diseases some years down the road. And the reason I bring it up is that when we did the multiple sclerosis study that I'm going to be talking to you about, and we looked at eight patients, 
there was a time lapse between they, when they suffered the cervical trauma and when they had the onset of multiple sclerosis. And when I averaged up all eight patients, the time lapse between the trauma and the onset of symptoms was 11 years. So there's no way to really know at the outset when you experience with the patient the trauma if or when he's apt to turn into one of these neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, uh, or like multiple sclerosis. Um, and so we took him to Dr. Rosa, and uh, Dr. Rosa treated him for a, uh, a cranial malrotation. And this patient came to us uh, with the onset of epileptic seizures. Initially, the, he had a drop attacks, and then the drop attacks ultimately turned into epileptic seizures. And when we scanned the patient, we saw this pr pronounced hydrocephalus, pronounced ventricular megaly, and the uh, cortical CSF, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, pooling phenomenon. And what, um, what we have observed in a goodly number of these patients is this is a, this is a common combo. Ventricular megaly together with cortical CSF pooling. When you see that pair on these patients, you have to worry about very severe increases in intracranial pressure. And the last patient is a especially interesting one to me, and I think it will be to you. Uh, this patient uh, had low back pain, and very serious low back pain. And when I interviewed the patient, the patient also had neck pain and shoulder pain. And uh, from talking with him, and I think some dizziness, from talking to him, it sounded to me that he had some, uh, uh, the, the, the signs and symptoms of this, uh, what I've been calling cranial cervical syndrome. So I said, look, come on and get a scan, okay? What I came to from the understanding of this, and I think that our chiropractor colleagues know this, but us MDs don't. When I went to medical school, the vertebral column was a stack of blocks. The spine is a lot more than a simple anatomic stack of blocks. It's a physiological entity from top to bottom. You do something at one end, you can have a profound consequence at the other end, which is something I just simply didn't know as a physician. Now, this is another patient who had multiple sclerosis. She just wanted to be scanned, and she was deteriorating to the point that she was worried about being in a wheelchair. So I looked at the images, and I was stunned. I said, look at that. There's a lesion right there, and it's connected directly to the ventricular CSF. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I thought it, you know, it was some sort of artifact. Then you can see the same thing over here. So we then went ahead and did some more uh, scans on her, and what we saw was a pronounced rotation, counterclockwise rotation of C2 when she was upright. And that counterclockwise uh, clockwise rotation went away when she was recovered, right here. But in addition, we saw this pronounced periventricular interstitial edema and even the hint of, uh, more than a hint, a pronounced evidence of leakage of the CSF into the surrounding tissue. Uh, and in both cases, you could see this. And what we were able to see as we started to look much more carefully at these lesions was they were almost always directly connected to the uh, ventricles, and it's something that the medical profession hadn't, hadn't fully uh, recognized. So we then went and did a study, and the next thing that I did was I looked in uh, Bill Bradley's book, and there's a chapter on multiple sclerosis. And the dominant thing on the images in the multiple sclerosis chapter was the MS lesions in their distribution. They were all periventricular. And I looked at them and I said, wait a minute. If these are just autoimmune tissue reactions, how come they're all sticking to the ventricle? And so that, that really drew our attention to the fact that um, we believe that these neurodegenerative diseases, multiple sclerosis being one example, are really consequences of uh, increased intracranial in, increased in, pressure, probably secondary in the main to cervical pathology that results in the linkage of the CSF. Now, this CSF, when I was an intern, is uh, not innocent stuff, even though it looks very innocent. My chief resident would say to me, debating, go ahead and get me a lumbar spine. I'd go put a needle in the lumbar spine, and I would sit there and watch until about five or 10 cc's of CSF came out into the test tube, and it looks completely innocent. It looks like water. And you, wouldn't, you don't take it any more seriously than it is water, but 
It's far cry from water. It has 300 proteins in there. And nine of those proteins are pronounced antigens. So this is not innocent stuff. So the, the, the real question is that in these patients in, in, in Dr. Bradley's book, in multiple sclerosis, where the multiple sclerosis lesions are periventricular, how come? If they're just antigen antibody reactions, why aren't they uniformly scattered all over the cortex? But they weren't. They were clicking to the uh, 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 periventricular territory. Okay, now I'm going to show you a set of pictures because we have this technology, thanks to David Chu uh, and Dr. Alperin. And uh, what you see here on the right is the CSF cine of a uh, normal, and you see the CSF cine in, one, in the first of the, actually the, the, the patient that I just showed you that had that malrotation. You can see there's pronounced obstruction of the CSF compared to what we should be seeing in the normal. And this is something we saw on virtually every MS patient, to my uh, astonishment. So that's patient number one. And you can see the pronounced interruption of CSF flow here on patient, MS patient number two. And this is MS patient number three. And not a one of these MS patients had normal CSF flow in addition to the cervical pathology we saw with the standard imaging. Patient number four, total interruption of the dorsal CSF flow as compared with the normal. <clears throat> and the thing that was interesting is I, we, I didn't select any of these patients. I just did them as they came. And I couldn't believe it. That's one right after the other had exactly the same thing with direct and outright obstruction and interruption of CSF flow, cervical CSF flow. This is perhaps even the most dramatic one. There's, there's the normal showing you a full 360 degree circulation of CSF around the cord. And here on the patient, you see is only half circulation around the cord because there's dorsal obstruction of CSF flow uh, dorsal to the cord. And patient number seven, there's a pronounced distortion of the anatomy uh, on the dorsal canal, complete obstruction of the dorsal canal, and very much impaired flow on the ventral canal. Uh, like this, share this video with someone you, you care about, uh, and make sure you look through our other videos. As you can tell, we can work with a variety of different types of things and we see them objectively go away. Not just that people perceive they're doing better, but they actually do get better. If you even live out of the country or out of the state, we're happy to talk to you and help you find someone near you if possible. So hope you have a happy day. Thanks for tuning in.